Welcome everybody. Becca, there's a hand that's raised. Do you see that? Oh, you're Do we can let people know that maybe we'll be taking oral comments later on after the presentation and that we'll be going in order. Of, we'll ask people to raise their hand and then I'll be unmuting everyone in order. Still feels like a, such an awkward kind of start when you've got these like meetings and Zoom still. How about we, it's 5.30 now. Why don't we give maybe one more minute, Debbie, and then you can kick it off. Okay. Yeah, okay. Okay, well, I think if our team is ready, we can go ahead and start the, the meeting right now, Debbie. Okay. Good evening. On behalf of Soquel Creek Water District, I'd like to welcome you to the public hearing for Pure Water Soquel Groundwater Replenishment Reuse Project, also known as a GRIP, G-R-R-P. This is the public hearing. And please note that the meeting is being recorded my name is Debbie Burris. I'm a civil engineer with DDB Engineering. Jan, you can go to the next slide. Just to review the agenda for the public hearing, we'll be making introductions of all the presenters and I'll talk about the purpose of the public hearing. Uh, DDW, the Division of Drinking Water will review the Title 22 regulations and Melanie will present a, uh, an overview of Pure Water SoCal. And then we'll open it up for comments at the end of the, of the hearing uh, and have some instructions about written comments. 
The purpose of the public hearing is to comply with Title 22 of the California Code of Regulations. Um, they're also known as the water recycling criteria and specifically section 60320.202. It requires a public hearing for the project and that's what we're doing tonight. The purpose is to inform the public about the Title 22 process and the Pure Water SoCal project and then provide the public with an opportunity to make, ask questions and make comments about the Title 22 engineering um, report, which the report is available on the website, which is noted here at www.socalcreekwater, all one word, .org slash GRRP. Now for introductions for, the, for our renowned speakers, we have Mir Ali, from State Water Resources Control Board, Division of Drinking Water, Recycled Water Unit. Mir is an engineer there. We have Melanie Mao Shoemaker, who is the Pure Water uh, SoCal Project Director with SoCal Creek Water District. We have Cameron Tanner, who is a Principal Hydrologist at Montgomery and Associates. And we also have um, Rob Beggs, who's Chief Engineer at Brown and Caldwell. And with that, I'll turn it over to Mir. Good evening, everyone. It's great to be here with the interested members of the public. My name is Mir Ali, and I'm a water resource control engineer in the Recycled Water Unit of the State Water Board's Division of Drinking Water, or DDW for short. To begin with my presentation, let me first explain why I'm here representing and presenting for Division of Drinking Water today. Next slide, please. As per the Title 22 in the California Code of Regulations, SoCal Creek is required to hold a public hearing on the proposed groundwater replenishment reuse recycled water project, which is being discussed now. The Regional Water Quality Control Boards are the permitting authority for these projects but the regional board consults with the Division of Drinking Water staff on topics related to the protection of public health. My goal here today is to explain the regulations and the permitting process for projects like SoCal Creek and to provide an overview of California statewide criteria for groundwater replenishment projects that are used to protect the public health. I'm also here so that you have an opportunity to ask any public health related questions about the proposed project. Next slide, please. The reason the regional boards consult with Division of Drinking Water is due to the nature of our mission and work. Division of Drinking Water regulates public drinking water systems across the state of California. And as part of this role, the Division of Drinking Water develops statewide water recycling criteria to ensure the protection of public health. Our team uses these water recycling criteria as a minimum benchmark for evaluating the recycled water projects independently. Based on these evaluations of the proposed projects, the Division of Drinking Water proposes recommendations for permit adaptions to the regional board regarding how the project proposed protects public health. Next slide. SoCal Creek's proposed projects and projects like these are called Groundwater Replenishment Reuse Projects, or GRIP for short. A GRIP is a direct, is, is, a, is a type of indirect portable reuse project that involves the planned use of advanced treated recycled municipal wastewater to replenishment a groundwater basin that's being used as a source of drinking water supply. Next slide. There are two types of GRIP projects described in the California Code of Regulations, Title 22 Water Recycling Criteria. Article 5.1 describes projects where recycled water is recharged to the groundwater at the surface using spreading basins. And Article 5.2 describes projects where recycled water is recharged directly into the groundwater using injection wells. SoCal Creek's proposed project utilizes injection wells and therefore falls under the category of Article 5.2, which is subsurface application project. Next slide. The goal of these GRIP regulations is to provide a drinking water source as safe as a conventional drinking water sources. 
that is as safe as water taken from the ground, which is where we are sending the advanced treated recycled water to. Next slide. To achieve this goal, the GRIP regulations broadly require systems to be reliable, robust, and resilient. A reliable system will provide, the cons will, will provide water that consistently meets or exceeds public health targets. The key way for achieving reliability is, is by requiring various instrumentations, monitoring, and reporting to validate performance at set frequencies. Next, a robust system will treat a broad variety of contaminants and is designed and operated in a manner that prevents failure from occurring. One way we address robustness is by requiring systems to include multiple treatment barriers, including different type of treatment processes that can treat different type of contaminants found in wastewater. Lastly, a resilient system will su successfully adapt to failure using design or operational systems that identify when a failure is occurring and responds in a manner that ensures no harm is done to public health. Next slide. On this slide, I'm showing you the section titles for the regulatory components of a subsurface application grip that you will find in Article 5.2 of Title 22 in the California Code of Regulations. As a disclaimer, I won't go over all of these sections due to the time, but let me highlight a few critical sections. Next slide. In the general requirements section, we require projects to demonstrate the following. First, we require the project sample the groundwater before the GRIP begins operations. This is to provide a baseline of the groundwater quality and to know if the water quality is degraded by the project after recycled water is injected into the ground. Second, we require projects to assess hydrogeology of the project's setting. Information from these studies, such as groundwater flow paths due to the project's operations, is used to establish control zones for drinking water well construction due to the project's op drinking water wells constructions around the area of injection wells. We also require projects to demonstrate technical and managerial capabilities. This is to ensure they can address the project scope and complexities over the long term. Lastly, the project must plan for alternative sources of drinking water. If a drinking water production well receiving GRIP's advanced treated recycled water is degraded below drinking water standards. Next slide. Wastewater source control requirement is a key method we use for protecting public health at the source in GRIP systems. Our approach is to require the wastewater agency to implement an industrial pretreatment and pollutant source control program that includes outreach to the community, maintenance of a chemical inventory in the sewer shed, and investigations to determine the source of specific chemicals in the sewer shed. Next slide. Pathogens in wastewater present an acute risk to public health. Therefore, in the pathogenic microorganism control section, we require projects to use multiple diverse treatment barriers to reduce concentration of pathogens to below the US EPA tolerable risk of infection, which is one in 10,000 per year per person. Treatment requirements are set for three key pathogens, which include enteric viruses, Giardia cyst, and Cryptosporidium osis. For each of these pathogens, we specify the percentage of pathogens that must be removed or inactivated across the portable reuse system. As you can see here, the percentages are very high and therefore we use the concept of log reduction to describe these reductions. Each one log reduction is 90% reduction in the pathogen concentration. These reductions can be achieved through a combination of treatment processes above ground and by the time the water stays underground. Next slide. In addition to the pathogens, wastewater also contains numerous chemicals that are known to be harmful to human health. As shown in the blue box here, several sections of the regulations address this concern for subsurface grip systems. The overall intent of these chemical sections is to verify treatment performance and the safety of the treated water with respect to chemicals. The approach we take is to specify monitoring and reporting requirements 
that target various compounds, including all constituents regulated in drinking water with maximum contaminant levels and notification levels, priority toxic pollutants commonly found in wastewater, and finally, any other chemicals specified by division of drinking water on a case-by-case -case basis. For example, we may specify monitoring of indicator compounds to obtain additional information about treatment performance. In case of exceedance of regulated constituents, there are specific requirements in the regulations that detail what the project needs to do. This includes notifying the water boards, local health agencies and authorities, and the public, as well as procedures on stopping the application of recycled water. Next slide. In the response retention time section, the regulations set a minimum time for advanced treated water to be retained underground. This allows the project adequate time to identify treatment failures and take necessary follow-up action to protect public health. The project proposes the response and retention time based on the project conditions following modeling and the retention time of the water underground is verified using a tracer study upon project startup. The minimum time that any project can propose is two months. Next slide. My last slides outline the permitting process for GRIP projects. This slide provides a very broad overview of the process. First, GRIP permits are issued by the Regional Water Quality Control Boards. And as part of the permitting process, a project sponsor, in this case, SoCal Creek, must submit a Title 22 engineering report to the Division of Drinking Water. The Title 22 engineering report describes the project details and the manner in which the project sponsor plans to meet the GRIP regulation, regulatory criteria. We at Division of Drinking Water review the Title 22 engineering report and ultimately provide recommendations for permit adoption to the Regional Water Quality Control Board regarding protection of public health. Separately, the regional boards conduct their own review process on various other aspects of the project. Next slide. On this slide, let me make, break down the process a bit more finely. First, SoCal Creek submitted the draft Title 22 engineering report for review by DDW. So far, the engineering report has undergone several rounds of review with SoCal Creek updating the re report based on the DDW's feedback. The next step was for SoCal Creek to conduct a public hearing, which is the event today. SoCal Creek will collect comments from this hearing and from the comment period, review and respond to all of them, and if necessary, make changes to the draft Title 22 engineering report. SoCal Creek will then submit the final Title 22 engineering report to Division of Drinking Water, which if deemed acceptable, DDW will issue a conditional acceptance letter to the regional board. The conditional acceptance letter will include recommended permit provisions for the protection of public health. From there, the regional board will prepare a draft order and go through their permit adoption process, which includes another public comment period for public feedback before the order is adopted at a regional board's meeting. Once the permit is issued by the regional board, we at Division of Drinking Water continue to be involved in the project. SoCal Creek will need to submit an operation and optimization plan to Division of Drinking Water. This plan identifies and describes the operations, maintenance, analytical methods, monitoring, and other items necessary for the GRIP to meet the regulatory requirements on an ongoing basis. DTW will also conduct a final in-person inspection of the project to verify all the critical alarms and other aspects of operations before the project injects any recycled water into the ground. Thereafter, the Division of Drinking Water will provide continued oversight throughout the entire lifespan of the project. Next slide. Thank you for your attention on this proposed GRIP project. We at the Division of Drinking Water will continue to work with SoCal Creek and the Regional Water Quality Control Board to ensure this proposed project meets all the applicable regulatory requirements and is protective of public health. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have either at the end of this session or, or by written comments or also via the email address listed on the contact slide here. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mir. 
um, as Debbie mentioned, um, I'm going to take the next series of slides that will go over and provide an overview of the SoCal Creek Water District, the Pure Water SoCal Project, and then I will turn it over to Cameron Tana and Rob Bakes, who will be joining and describing a little bit more on the technical aspects that were performed and included in the engineering report. So next slide. Um, SoCal Creek Water District is a a special district non for profit organization that provides groundwater to um, our community here in the Santa Cruz Mid County region. We provide water to about 40,000 residents through approximately 14,000 connections, and about 94% of our customers are residential. As you can see on the map, we provide uh, water to um, most of the unincorporated mid-county region of Santa Cruz, including a small portion of the city of Capitola. Again, all of our water comes from groundwater. We have about 16 groundwater wells, and we pump that water through over 165 miles of pipeline. We're an organization that's pretty lean, having less than 50 employees, and we're governed by an elected board of five uh, board of directors. I've been an employee here for over 25 years, and I'm also a proud resident of SoCal as well. Next slide. Um, so this is a map of um, the Santa Cruz Mid-County Groundwater Basin. SoCal Creek Water District receives 100% of its water from this groundwater basin. Um, we do not receive in our area any imported water from the state. Lots of communities in California are connected to the state water import system. But here in the Santa Cruz area, we rely solely on rainfall that falls on this side of the Santa Cruz mountains, just like today. Um, one thing to note is that our groundwater basin is shared by many pumpers, including the city of Santa Cruz, SoCal Creek Water District, Central Water District, and then thousands of private well pumpers. So this is a very critical resource uh, of water for our region. Next slide. One of the things to note always when we're starting to talk about our solution to our water challenges is to make sure that people understand what the challenges that we face here. And our primary challenge here is a critically overdrafted groundwater basin. Um, the Santa Cruz Mid-County Groundwater Basin is one of 21 basins in California that are designated with what we call the scarlet letter of being critically overdrafted. What that means is that um, under mandate, the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, the basin must be brought back into sustainability by 2040. Um, what happens when a basin is um, overdrafted is conditions such as seawater intrusion occur. That's displayed in that top left uh, map where you can see the seawater is coming right along our coastline as well as being detected on shore. Um, the data um, is really important in, in terms of us understanding um, and monitoring. So we not only do we collect water quality samples, both water quality and water levels, we also conducted a study using the technology here you see in this picture called SkyTem which is an aerial geophysical tool that helped uh, map the groundwater conditions below the ocean, as well as um, along some portions of inland in our basin. The map on the bottom left shows that seawater intrusion isn't just occurring here in our area of the Monterey Bay, but it is occurring all along the coastline, including down in the marina area, down into Salinas and Monterey, and as you can see, all the way seven miles inland in that basin, it goes towards the Salinas, uh, city of Salinas. Next slide. So um, our SoCo Creek Water District Board of Directors worked with our community um, to develop a community water plan. In 2015, we sought a lot of community input um, and developed a plan for the community by the community. It not only included water supply solutions, but it really was tied to conservation as our cornerstone, and of course, adaptable groundwater management. So the primary tenants are to use water efficiently, to work with our project partners in adaptable groundwater management through our Mid-County Groundwater Agency, and then of course, develop new water supplies. We did look at a portfolio of different water supply options, 
including um, recycled water, taking excess treated river water, and also stormwater capture. Next slide. So in 2015, um, Soquel Creek Water District pursued further evaluation of the Pure Water Soquel project and really focusing on recycled water as an option to help meet our water challenges. The Pure Water Soquel project here, uh, physically shown, is a project that um, basically includes three components. We have treatment processes, we have pipelines, and then we have the seawater intrusion prevention wells. This is a project that is designed to meet um, the basin shortfall as well as our uh, projected uh, planned growth. Um, and the goal is for our project to produce up to 1,500 acre feet per year or about 1.3 million gallons per day of purified water. There is also a component that would produce about 0.3 million gallons of tertiary treated water for the city of Santa Cruz to use at their uh, treatment plant facility, as well as to irrigate a nearby park and a fill station. But the Pure Water Soquel project, the groundwater replenishment project, um, includes the two treatment projects, two 16-inch pipelines that go from, I don't know if you guys can see my stars, from the star on the left um, to the middle star, which is the purification facility, there'll be two 16-inch pipelines. One pipeline to convey the source water to the water purification facility, and then another 16 inch pipeline to go back to the wastewater treatment plant that would carry the reverse osmosis concentrate. Then we have four miles of pipeline that what's depicted in blue, which is a 14 inch pipeline that would carry and convey the purified water to the three seawater intrusion prevention wells um, that are located with the three red stars. Uh, we have one well at the Monterey Avenue site, we have one in Willowbrook Avenue, and then we have Twin Lakes Church. So the three wells there are located in the Capitola um, Aptos community. One thing to note that in addition to that, um, we do have nine monitoring wells that will also um, help us monitor the water quality um, as the project becomes operational. And the project is expandable in the future. So the pipelines have been sized so that if uh, the Pure Water Soquel project is expanded, to double capacity and treat up to 3,000 acre feet per year. Um, we can do that. The pipelines have already been put in place, so we do not have to go back into the streets. We would have to do some additional modifications to the treatment plant sites, um, and we would also have to do more um, permitting and project design. Next slide. And this is a great visual tool that we like to show um, people in terms of their understanding of really how does the purified water uh, work when it goes into the ground? The picture on the left depicts the condition of seawater intrusion. When more water is extracted out of a production well, um, that causes that seawater intrusion to come in. Salt water is much more dense. Um, inland in California, where they don't have a nearby ocean, that's where a condition called subsidence will occur and the groundwater or the ground levels will actually go down. In our community, that's not the case. That seawater intrusion will come in and then that will contaminate our groundwater basin. With Pure Water Soquel, and that's the picture on the right, we'll be replenishing the groundwater basin by putting purified water in. That purified water would create a positive gradient outflow out to the ocean, as well as commingle and help replenish the groundwater basin to increase protective water levels, stave off further seawater intrusion, and eventually becoming um, groundwater. Next slide. Um, graphically uh, showing this one is a pie chart of how our water portfolio is envisioned for Pure Water Soquel. Um, just like a, a bank account, you know, you really like to have um, diversification. For us, we noticed that when we had only groundwater, um, especially that was susceptible, we were at risk of not having a reliable uh, supply. So in terms of reliability and sustainability, our long-term portfolio, we do see will continue to be groundwater, conservation, pure water Soquel. We still are evaluating pursuing water transfers and purchase with the city of Santa Cruz. 
And in the future, you know, um, if stormwater capture um, becomes a reality, we do see that that could also provide a small fraction. Next slide. In terms of pure water SoCal, there are many benefits. Um, one of the things to note, and I didn't notice, I didn't say it on the slide that showed our map, but currently about six to eight million gallons a day of treated secondary effluent goes out to the Monterey Bay Sanctuary every day from the Santa Cruz wastewater treatment plant. So pure water SoCal is really designed to recycle that water. Um, and instead of discharging it to the ocean, to put that water back to beneficial reuse on land. I already spoke about the project being a seawater intrusion barrier and that it would be a reliable um, and drought proof uh, and climate proof water supply. Again, this project is timely. Um, I'll go into it in a little bit um, later in a couple other slides, but this is a tried and true technology that has been implemented in other areas of the state and around the world. So um, it's proven technology has helped accelerate the timely implementation of a project such as this. Again, we're um, uh, planning on sourcing our, um, our PG&E with some clean energy. And we've done an economic evaluation of the project through a study by uh, Professor Brent Haddad at UCSC, who within his economic study identified that our project would return about $900 million in economic benefit to our community and help protect jobs um, um, houses still being built and, you know, a thriving economic uh, community. So that really is another benefit of our project. And then, of course, first and foremost, you know, we want a project that has proven high quality water. And I did already speak about the project being able to be scaled up in the future. Next slide. So this is a visual uh, depiction of the treatment processes at Pure Water Soquel. Um, as, we, as I said earlier, we will be taking treated secondary effluent that is going out um, to the ocean every day and taking that water and putting it through a multi-step process um, to create that purified water. So we have a split facility. We have um, the secondary pump station and a strainer at the Santa Cruz wastewater treatment plant. In addition to that, although not shown on this slide, we do have a small tertiary facility that will be pre uh, creating recycled water. And that was done in another engineering report. Specific to our, this engineering report is the water that would be treated to purified levels. So I will go and then now describe what's on that right side of the red line which are the facilities at the Chanticleer plant. At the Chanticleer Advanced Water Purification Facility, we'll be taking that treated secondary effluent and then putting it through a pretreatment step of ozone and then going through microfiltration, reverse osmosis, hitting that with UV light and advanced oxidation, and that creates that purified water that would then go and be sent out to the three seawater intrusion prevention wells. Um, there is a... a a byproduct stream that is generated from the purification facility that will go back into that 16 inch pipeline and go and be commingled back out into the Santa Cruz wastewater treatment plants outfall and then be discharged out into the bay. Next slide. So this is a slide that we use a lot. Um, part of our education and outreach to our community has been um, two learning centers. We have a learning center here at the SoCal Creek Water District office. Um, and we also have an educational trailer that we drive around the community um, at different uh, events. And this is a, a board that we have in there that we feel has been very useful in explaining to our community on what the treatment process is. So the microfiltration process um, is um, a treatment process that takes out um, a lot of the solids and bacteria and viruses because the holes within the microfiltration are very small. Um, one of the things that we always like to explain is that, that the holes within those small strands of the microfiltration is one three hundredth of the diameter of a human hair. So a lot of the treatment process will go through that microfiltration process. 
um, what gets passed through will then go into the reverse osmosis uh, step. The reverse osmosis membranes, you know, people are very familiar with that. That is a treatment process that's used with desalination. There are small scale processes that people have at their homes and underneath their kitchen sink. This process there takes away, uh, again, much smaller, takes away a lot of the um, things within the water and creates water to that is like near distilled quality. Uh, one of the things that is very helpful to people to understand is that that water um, is of better quality than um, bottled water. And as we say here, baby food manufacturers and for kidney dialysis. That water then goes through an additional step um, and that's the ultra uh, ultraviolet light and we hit it with advanced oxidation. So that uh, the remaining water will go through that process and that is where a lot of the pharmaceuticals and trace chemicals are destroyed. And then that water will then go out to the purified uh, seawater intrusion protection laws. Next slide. Um, so, so that's kind of the visual of how that water is treated, but you know, from what, what NIR and DDW and what our technical team also look at are really a slew of water quality requirements. And this is um, an illustration of the water quality requirements and criteria that are met um, really come from three primary documents. We have the Title 22 Recycled Water Criteria, we also have the water quality control plan for the Central Coast Basin. And then we also have the water quality criteria that's in the recycled water policy that's put out by the State Water Resources Control Board. Next slide. Um, as I mentioned, you know, the project really has a, a proven approach for water quality. Um, the purified water, as Mir said, and as we will have, we'll continue to say, and, and what is within our engineering report, is that the water is um, geared toward meeting or exceeding all federal and state uh, requirements. This water is of better quality than treated groundwater and surface water. The district has been working with our state regulators uh, for many years, um, since 2018, I believe, when we first started uh, evaluating this project, we have created a technical advisory committee and that technical advisory committee has been um, meeting with us on a regular basis as we've been developing the design of the project and the engineering report. And then, as I mentioned before, and I'm going to go into a couple of slides, but there are many groundwater replenishment projects in California. So next slide. This is a map illustrating uh, projects that are actually permitted and operational, um, where they're taking purified water and using them to replenish the groundwater basin. There, um, there are 315,000 acre feet a year of permitted uh, water that is generated through these projects. That equals over 190 million gallons a day that is being produced. Um, I would like to just focus on two of the projects here. Um, in this top right area where there's a picture of the groundwater replenishment project, that's kind of the what we call the grandfather project in California. It's the Orange County's groundwater replenishment system. Um, this project has, it's probably the largest one um, in California. And, and I think if you go onto their website, they'll actually say the largest in the world for indirect potable reuse. It's produced over 396 billion gallons of purified water to date. The facility currently treats 100 million gallons per day um, and is um, currently undergoing an expansion to add another 30 million gallons per day. 35 million gallons per day of that project goes specifically to recharge projects, similar to what we're doing with Pure Water SoCal. The remainder of that project they have and they diversify that through um, um, spreading basins. Um, and then the project on the top left is the Pure Water Monterey project, which is a neighbor project. It's just down the road in Marina. That project came online in 2019 and it produces about, they tend to speak in acre feet, 3,500 uh, 3, acre feet per year. Um, and it uses the exact same technology as Pure Water SoCal. It's also going through a potential expansion on the slide. This is a slide that shows all of the planned projects in California that are similar to us. As you can see, we're um, right there on the top um, since we're undergoing um, 
and are not yet fully operational, but there are many projects in California that are right in the same um, kind of process that we are looking at uh, bringing um, recycled water into their water portfolio. In total, I believe that the uh, group of projects here on this slide equal about 317 million gallons a day of recycled water that would be generated or what that equates to is about uh, 356,000 acre feet per year. So there is a big um, recognition in California that recycled water needs to be um, a resource to look at for uh, sustainability and reliability of water for many communities in California. And next slide. I just have a two more slides before I turn it over to Cameron, who's gonna go into some of the technical evaluation. And this is kind of, what is the project gonna look like? And so for the seawater intrusion prevention wells, um, we have three of them that will be located, as I said, in Capitola and in Aptos. Um, we um, wanna belong and fit right within our community. So um, the picture on the left, uh, illustrates what the Willowbrook uh, well site looked like prior to construction, and on the right, what the site will look like once it is built. Um, again, it's really um, kind of should be blended well. We'll have some landscaping. Um, we'll have some security fencing, but you know, a very I, I think um, nice addition to a, a community it would be replenishing the basin and and you know be, be visually pleasing. And then the next slide is the water purification facility um, at the Shanna Clear site. So um, this facility um, has been underway. We broke ground in December of 2021. That's the picture on the right. Uh, the picture on the bottom right is the purification facility building um, just last month. Um, Overall, this is an artistic rendering of what our facility will look like when it comes online in 2024. Um, a lot of the construction thus far has been underground. We have now started to come up and go vertical. Um, but some nice features that I would just like to point out in terms of our site is this is a facility site that's just right off of the freeway. Uh, so we will have some, some visibility in our community. We also um, are sharing our site with the Regional Transportation Commission. Um, they will be building a bike pedestrian overcrossing. So this is a great nexus to illustrate that sustainable transportation and water projects are, are, are being built here in our region. Um, construction has been underway and we continue to have construction through 2023. Um, and just some other things to note on our facility site is that we will be having um, a demonstration garden. We will be having a learning center. And we do foresee we will be doing tours of the facility when it's online. Next slide. And now I'd like to turn it over to Cameron Tana, who is our hydrologist, and he'll go over the groundwater model and um, technical evaluation. Thank you. Thank you, Melanie. Uh, I'll be talking about the groundwater modeling used in the Title 22 engineering report, specifically estimates of underground retention times. And underground retention times are the travel times for the purified water between groundwater recharge wells and groundwater production wells can be used for drinking water. So it's how long does it take for the purified water underground from where it's recharged to where it's extracted. And it's important to estimate these underground retention times because it does provide, uh, it does help with protection of public health as, as Mir explained earlier. And that includes helping to reduce viruses. Uh, it can help reduce viruses with the robust system after treatment, additional underground retention time to for that purpose. And it also provides enough time for to respond to any issues with treat, treatment facilities, make sure there's a resiliency of the underground retention time before that water is extracted and any issues can be addressed before the water is extracted. We also use the modeling to establish monitoring well locations so that we can monitor the effects of the groundwater recharge on the basin during operation. Next slide, please. 
So on the ground retention times are estimated based off of the basin model of the Santa Cruz Mid-County Basin, which is the same model used for the basin's groundwater sustainability plan. And these estimates are also supported by analytical equations as allowed by the regulations. The basin model represents the multi-aquifer system that a, the basin consists of. The basin has a series of stacked aquifer and aquitard units as shown in the cross section on the screen. Pure water Soquel will recharge into two of these aquifer units at the three seawater intrusion prevention or SWIP recharge wells that Melanie described earlier. So these wells are shown on the next click. The three wells recharge into the two units, one well into the Prisma BC unit, which is uh, the blue layer in the cross section, as well as the deeper A unit, which is the yellow layer in the cross section. And as shown on the next click, the underground retention times to the nearest drinking water wells are significant. In the shallower BC unit, it's over 200 months to the nearest drinking water wells along Pine Tree Lane to the southwest. That's over 17 years. In the A unit, recharge the nearest drinking water well, which is the Soquel Creek Water District's a state's production well. It's over 40 months, so over three years to that well. Going to the west, is the Willowbrook SWIP well. That only recharges the Parissima A unit, and it's at least 56 months to the nearest drinking water well, which is over four years. Nearest drinking water well being the district's Tanatory 2 production well to the west. The Monterey SWIP well also recharges only the Parissima A unit. That's the farthest west well. And as you can see in the two maps, the extent of underground retention times up to th up to three years. There are two wells within three years of the Monterey Swip well recharge, but over two and a half years at 33 to 39 months. And so that is the shortest underground retention time estimated by the modeling and analytical equations is 33 months. And as it was talked about on the next slide. That 33 months is enough to provide the robustness of six log reduction in underground retention time. And so that in combination with the tr treatment processes that Melanie described earlier, the microfiltration, the reverse osmosis, the ultraviolet light plus the advanced oxidation, that leads to 13.5 log reductions for viruses, which exceeds the required log reduction of 12 by one and a half. The three treatment processes described by Melanie provide 11 and a half log reduction for Giardia cryptosporidium, which also exceeds the required minimum log reduction of 10 by one and a half. So the three treatment processes plus the amount of time the purified water is underground in combination exceeds the requirements from the regula regulations for removal of these pathogens. Next slide, please. Modeling also informs our development of the monitoring network for this project. The Regulations require two monitoring wells around each of the recharge wells, uh, between the recharge wells and nearby drinking water wells. The first well is must be located between two weeks and six months travel times and at least 30 days upgrading of the nearest drinking water wells. The wells that have been installed for this purpose are, are marked in yellow and are the closest monitoring wells to the SWIP wells. The regulations also require a second monitoring well between the SWIP well and the drinking water wells. 
we the district has constructed them farther out from the wells marked in yellow. These farther out wells are marked in pink are closer to the nearest drinking water wells. And so to meet the requirements, there are two wells around the Monterey Swip well, which recharges the Prisma A unit only. Also two wells near the Willowbrook Swip well, recharges the Prisma A unit only. But because the Twin Lakes Church well recharges or will recharge two Prisma aquifer units, there are four monitoring wells that have been installed to meet the requirements. So Cal Creek Water District actually installed a fifth well that's not required to provide further monitoring of operation once operation begins. So of the wells to meet the requirements, they will be sampled four times prior to operation to characterize the groundwater quality prior to operation. And then once operation begins, sampling will continue quarterly to track changes to groundwater quality as purified water is recharged into the basin. Next slide, please. Amir mentioned the need for reliability from the system. Underground retention time provides reliability by making sure there's enough time to response respond to any issues that could occur in the treatment system. So response retention time is the amount of time to identify treatment system failures and then implement corrective actions. That time is calculated by several components, including the estimated travel time to the nearest monitoring well, because it's at the nearest monitoring well where you would see an issue in the groundwater. The estimated time to the nearest monitoring well is 1.1 to 1.6 months, depending on the range of recharge rates that could be implemented at the Monterey SWIP well. And that estimate is conservatively multiplied by four, giving four and a half to six months to identify the issue in groundwater at the nearest monitoring well. In combination for the amount of time to receive results and confirm results from the laboratory two and a half months, plus half a month to decide on a response and procure alternative supply, the calculated response retention time is seven and a half to 9.2 months. So we need to make sure that the underground retention time is longer than that, so there's enough time to respond to any issue. Next slide, please. And making sure that underground retention time is long enough is really defined by well construction control zones. These are areas where well construction will be prohibited in primary well construction control zones. And we do not want existing wells to, to be located to make sure that there is, that underground retention time exceeds the res response retention time. There's enough time to respond before water arrives at any of these drinking water wells. And around the any of these swip wells, there are no existing drinking water wells in the primary control zone where well construction will be prohibited. There are two uh, private wells in the secondary control zone around the Monterey swip well. The secondary control zone is an area beyond the response for retention time where further study is required to allow additional construction of wells. So this control zone will be evaluated with further study with the tracer study that is required by the regs once operation begins. So these conservatively established well construction control zones show there are no, all wells currently are beyond the response retention times and will prevent construction of new wells in that area. Next slide, please. So the tracer study, that Mir mentioned is required by the regulations to verify these estimates from modeling and analytical equations. Do this tracer study once pure water SoCal starts operating because you want to use the tracer to study to see how far and fast is the purified water actually traveling. So we use this to verify underground retention time estimates and also update calculations of response retention times and definitions of control zones. The tracer study will include 
intrinsic tracers and added tracers. So intrinsic tracer is basically just tracking the higher quality of the purified water as it goes underground. And so when we see that higher quality at monitoring wells, then you know that the purified water has arrived. The added tracer, which is required by the regulations, is accomplished by adding a drinking water safe dye to the recharged water and tracking the concentrations of that dye as it arrives at wells. For this tracer study, the district will sample the monitoring wells that it's installed for the project. And we'll also seek to access and monitor the nearest private wells. We will be contacting those private wells to see if they would like to participate uh, very shortly. So what I'll do is specifically at each of the wells at the Monterey SWIP well did note that there are two wells in the secondary control zone and it'll verify that that control zone is beyond the response for tension time. The Willowbrook SWIP well, it'll verify that there isn't transport from the A unit, which is being re recharged by that well to shallower units where there is, where there is a private well. And at the Twin Lakes Church SWIP well, it'll verify the underground retention times in both the A and B C units, which are being recharged at that well. So the modeling and the analytical equation calculations have helped us estimate the underground retention time and with factors of safety ensure that public health is protected for drinking water produced from groundwater. The tracer study will provide hard data once operation begins to confirm that is the case. Thank you. Thank you, Cameron. I'm going to talk about the anti-degradation analysis that was performed for the project. Next slide, please. Anti-degradation, this is looking at the groundwater basin and making sure that any degradation that happens is you know, well within standards and well within uh, being of maximum benefit to the people of the state. Uh, more specifically, what the anti-degradation analysis supports is first, it's required for permitting for the recycled water operations. It takes the place of a salt and nutrient management plan for the mid-county groundwater basin because there isn't one right now for that basin. Um, and it's done by assessing the impact on the groundwater basin using purified water for groundwater recharge. Determine if the recharge operations would be protective of beneficial uses and the overriding beneficial uses uh, here are drinking water and irrigation. And then to evaluate the criteria for showing that the project is of maximum benefit to the people of the state for any degradation. Next slide. First, uh, looking at groundwater uh, basin water quality objectives, you can see those in parts per million or milligrams per liter in the third column. And then the fourth column that has the green shading, that's the pure water quality, which as you can see, it's far below the uh, maximum water quality objectives um, in, for all the major salts and nutrients and boron, which is an agricultural water quality objective. Next slide, please. So assimilative capacity, that's looking at how much uh, constituents in the groundwater basin can be changed before water quality objectives are exceeded. In this case, you can see in the uh, second column, the recharge water quality is there in uh, milligrams per liter. The difference from background, and that you judge it based on comparing it with, with the background groundwater quality. And then the assimilative capacity is looked at in terms of the mass for the groundwater basin. And in the shaded column, because the water is so pure coming out of the project, it actually gives back assimilative capacity to the basin for the salts and uses a tiny bit of the capacity for the nitrate. But in all cases, it's less than the 10% assimilative capacity, which is the requirement by the state. Next slide. So what are the effects on actual drinking water wells? And this is based on the modeling that Cameron talked about and looking at the capture of 
water that's been recharged by nearby wells. And you can see in the uh, green shaded columns with the project compared to the columns just to the left of each of them, with the project, chlorides improve significantly and uh, total dissolved solids or salinity improves compared to the current situation. So for those constituents, which are a major part of salt and nutrient management, um, it's actually being improved by the project. Next slide. So the overall findings, uh, the findings are that the project is consistent with the state of California's any degradation policy. The advanced treated recycled water meets the groundwater basin's water quality objectives by a wide margin. We also did three different uh, geochemistry studies to see if there were any effects on um, constituents that are already in the groundwater or in the uh, material in the ground that might be affected. And we determined that uh, geochemistry, any geochemistry effects are likely to be temporary and not cause exceedances of groundwater quality objectives. And we particularly focused on uh, arsenic, fluoride, and boron uh, for those. Implementation of the groundwater recharge project is in line with the beneficial uses of the Sacramento, I'm sorry, excuse me, Santa Cruz Mid-County Groundwater Basin and for the maximum benefit of the people, and that is drinking water and irrigation water. And uh, with that, I'll turn it uh, back to Melanie. Hi, thank you, Rob. Um, just in summary, I think we'd just like to reiterate that Pure Water SoCal is going to be using proven technology to provide the drought resilient, reliable water supply to create up to 1,500 acre feet a year of local purified water for our community. Um, we will comply with the state's regulations for a Title 22 groundwater replenishment and reuse project. And that the advanced treated purified water um, from Pure Water SoCal will meet or exceed the federal and state drinking water quality requirements to recharge the Santa Cruz Mid-County groundwater basin. Next slide. And then this uh, projects like this um, re require, and we're very appreciative of um, partnerships and some, um, stakeholders who help support um, the implementation and development. Here, we're just recognizing um, our collaborative partners um, from the city of Santa Cruz, county of Santa Cruz, city of Capitola, the Mid-County Groundwater Basin, and the Regional Transportation Commission. The project also has received both state and federal uh, funding um, from the State Water Board, from the Bureau of Reclamation, from EPA, and um, interim financing with CoBank. And then again, um, a project like this uh, requires a big team of, of support. And as shown here, we do have quite a few um, consultants and project specialists who have helped us um, along the way. So thank you. And I think with that, it um, we pretty much concludes the, the presentation portion of our project. So I'm gonna turn it over to Debbie and she's gonna um, go through now couple of informational slides related to the public comment period, and then she'll open it up for public comment. So thank you very much. I'd like to thank all of the presenters um, for their technical explanations and descriptions about the project. And now we enter the purpose of this public hearing and that's to receive public comments and questions via oral comments this evening. However, we recommend that you follow up with a written comment via either mail or email as shown um, here on this slide, just to make sure that we've properly captured your comment and understand what your, your, your question may be. And then as appropriate, the Title 22 engineering report may be revised to address the comments. Responses to the comments will be posted on the district's website. Next slide, please. So just a few ground rules about, about oral comments this evening. Um, attendees will be muted when they're not called upon until they're called upon to make a comment. Uh, please state your name for the record and the time limit for comments for oral comments is three minutes. We'll have a little timer there and let you know how you're doing on time. Uh, and please only comment 
on the engineering report, the Title 22 engineering report. That's the purpose of this public hearing. Uh, instructions for written comments will be provided at the close of the meeting. The website uh, will have the responses to comments that uh, will be made tonight but uh, we won't really be uh, responding directly tonight to any comments. Next slide. This is how to submit comments via writing or email. And we're just gonna leave this up and please feel free to voice your comments. We're, we're happy that you're here and look forward to receiving comments. Dan, can you bring up the timer, please? If you would like to make a comment, please raise your hand and I will call on you and let you know that your mic is available as I see hands being raised. Ms. Steinbrenner, your mic is available. Please state your name and then proceed with your comments. Thank you. This is Becky Steinbrenner. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Uh, I, I ask that you put the slides that you're showing on the screen um, on the website because those of us coming in by telephone cannot see them. Thank you for doing that. I, I have a question. Um, will the uh, NPDES um, permit by the Santa Cruz wastewater treatment plant take into account this increase in concentrated disinfectant and also temperature changes. And what um, studies are there being done to uh, monitor the impacts on the marine habitats at the outflow? Um, I, that's table 4.18. I note that there is still no final anti-degradation report. If you can please uh, provide a timeline when that will be done and available to the public. At this point, everything is based on high um, conjecture and modeling, but I note that the AEM studies were not even done at real, uh, real earth sites. <laughs> they were done on a grid that was um, put on a, a screen somewhere. So I'm very, very concerned about this. Um, I, I know that there is a preponderance of um, geochemical, geophysical analysis um, included for the Twin Lakes Church injection well, but nothing for the other two. So I want that level of geophysical um, analysis done as well for Willowbrook and Monterey, noting that there are extreme differences as within five feet of the... Um, depth of the 600 One foot minute. area. I, I ask that the, um, oh man, you, I'm sorry, you made me lose my train of thought. Um, that the, there be a, a study of the radio impacts and how effective they will be. It makes me very nervous that the time is four to six months before there could be uh, a problem noted. I would like real time sampling at seconds. the point of injection rather than um, modeling in a long time before we find out if there are problems. Um, I have more uh, more comments. I don't think it's fair that there have been an hour of presentation and we only get three minutes. I'd like more time, please. Hello? Hello. Your time is up, Ms. Steinbrunner. You can you can um, submit written comments, and that uh, instruction will be put back on again. Time? Thank you. I don't think it. Becky, are you going to be submitting written comments as well, or only oral? So that just so it's not, you know, we're trying to reduce the duplicitous nature of a comment. Thank you. I heard the question if I'm going to be submitting written comment as well. Um, yes, I will be, um, but I was hoping for some answers tonight uh, from your specialists, your experts there that could help me better understand the information that I'm seeing in your report. 
Is that going to be possible? The, res the responses will be written. So they're, they're hearing your comments as well as they would be also receiving your comments that you would be submitting in writing. All right, uh, I have one final question then, uh, one comment. It looks like primarily the um, unit A is going to be um, um, where the pressure injection will be. Please clarify what unit um, your AEM studies, which are all hypothetical, are showing the saltwater, freshwater interface. Is this effectively going to hold back or push back the saltwater intrusion interface? Thank you. I'll let others speak now, and, and thank you for letting me have a bit more time. Caller 831-818-9733, your mic is available. I believe you pressed star six to unmute yourself on your telephone. I unfortunately can't unmute a telephone call in. Try pressing star six on your telephone keypad. Can you hear me? I keep doing uh, it. Now we can hear you. Okay. Please state your name Perfect. and you can begin with your comments. Hi, my name is Patty Pickett and I have a comment. Firstly, I appreciate the work that the SoCal Water District is doing in implementing the Pure Water SoCal project. I am a longtime resident of Santa Cruz County and I rely on the groundwater basin, which I understand is overdrawn and getting contaminated by the seawater. Um, I appreciate the technical evaluation and the studies that have been underway and uh, understand they will continue when Pure Water SoCal comes online. Uh, I feel that it's good to hear that other projects in California that are operating and producing purified water to replenish their groundwater basin. And it's good planning in our region to recycle water and not have it wasted and just sent out to the ocean. Um, I thank you for implementing this project and working with the state make sure that we have reliable water for our community and for the future. That's my comment. Thank you. Thank you so much. If anyone else would like to make a comment, please raise your hand. I am not seeing any more hands raised, Melanie. Okay. Um, well, I think, Debbie, if you want to close this, or I can, <laughs> I, I'm just realizing we didn't rehearse that last part. Sure. No. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for attending the public hearing tonight. I really appreciate the public comments. Um, and if you could go to the slide, there it is, yeah, for submitting written comments and how to submit those to either email or that mail address. Um, and I'd also like to call attention that on the website, the PDF of tonight's presentation, as well as the engineering report is posted. Um, if you'd like to look at the slides of the presentation again, or any part of the engineering report, uh, they're available on the website and we look forward to receiving comments and responses will be posted. Uh, otherwise, uh, thank you very much. Good evening. Thank you, everybody. Really appreciate you spending the evening with us to learn more about the project. And yes, if you have a comment, please submit um, and the information is on our website. So thank you.